den počutovani gledači. Denes je 19. oktobri 2013. godina in je sne povtorno zajedno s vas vo vašite domovi. Makedonsko izdanje je emisija koja što se emituva seko aftora sabota vo 12.30 časov popladne na Rogers televizija na kanalite 10, 63.84 i vo High Definition 510 vo Južno Ontario. Jaz sem Poveda Piskačeva, urednikot i voditeljot na ova vaša programa i vi blagodaram mnogu što v narednite 30. minuti odlučivte da bidete zajedno so nas. Vo dnešnjega emisija, ki prodolžime so intervjuta so gospodinom Sam Vaknin, doktor po filozofiji od Izrael, koji momentalno žive v Makedonija. Gospodinom Vaknin ima napišeno nekoliko knjigi, za koji ima dobijeno vrdni priznanja, među koji je knjiga ta posled doždot, kako zapadot go izgubi istokot. To je i avtor na knjiga ta Maligna ljubov prema sebe si, na vrakjanje vo narcisoidnosta, vo koja je razrabotuva temata na narcisoidnosta, mentalno poremetuvanje na ličnosta, diagnoza koja što i samjot ja poseduva. Sam Vaknin vo Minatoto beše i sovetnik na Ministerstvo za financije na Makedonija, a je i ekonomski analitičar i sovetnik na poveke biznesi vo Makedonija, Češka i Rusija, urednike na web stranata Global Politician, Freelancer sovetnik na mnogo izraelski firmi za blu čipovi koji se zanimava dvoglavnom so investiciji vo Izrael, Kanada, Velika Britanija i Sojedinetite Amerikanski državi. Gospodin od Vaknin je isto taka i freelance novinar za različni medijumi vo Sojedinetite Amerikanski državi, a ureduva i nekoliko web sajtovi. Vo prvi del od intervjuto razgovarav me za političkata situacija vo Makedonija, vo odnos na albanskoto naselenije i za problemot što naši od južen sosed go ima so naše to ime i što vo suština se krije vo pozadina na seto toa. Does this mean that Macedonia and Macedonians should actually wait for time to resolve this issue? and not do anything else, which is very difficult, as you know, might understand. We are Macedonians and uh, there are so many countries in the world that recognized our republic under our constitutional name. And then, yet again, we have so many troubles getting into European Union. And uh, what do we do? The main damage the main outcome of the conflict with Greece is Macedonia's inability to join the European Union. That's the main price Macedonia is paying for not acceding to the Greek uh, unreasonable demands. However, if we analyze this price that Macedonia is paying, we discover that in economic terms, Macedonia is not losing much. It is losing only in political terms. Macedonia needs to join NATO and the European Union in order to preserve its internal cohesiveness. You see, all the countries who joined the EU and NATO joined the EU and NATO in order to fend off the Russian risk, the Russian bear, or in order to prosper economically. Macedonia is one of the few countries, if not the only country, which wishes to join these organizations in order not to fall apart. If Macedonia doesn't join the EU, the Albanians inside Macedonia will become restive, if they become restive, there is a chance for another insurgency, another internal conflict, another civil war, and there is no telling what would happen to Macedonia this time. So Macedonia needs these memberships in these clubs to pacify the Albanians, as simple as that. From the economic point of view, Macedonia is not losing much, because Macedonia already enjoys full free trade with the European Union and SEFTA, Macedonia has bilateral and, and tax treaties, bilateral tax treaties with the vast majority of European countries. Macedonia is the recipient of regional funds from the European Union. It is also the recipient of cohesion funds and so on. 
the cost in real terms is about 100 million uh, euros uh, over the last five years. That's the real cost of the Macedonian conflict, of the Macedonian Greek conflict. But the problem is political. Um, having these uh, programs, uh, our government, uh, to attract uh, more uh, foreign investments, uh, how do you view it? Do we have enough? And it's obvious that we would like more. Are people coming, investing in our country, in Macedonia? Not really. And these programs are a waste of time. Foreign direct investments follow prosperity. They don't create prosperity. Mm -hmm. Foreign investors want to come to countries which are already stable, already to some degree prosperous, where, is a, where there is a local purchasing power, which is substantial, where is an internal market, which is big, where there is possibility for exports, and so on. As long as Macedonia is politically unstable, owing to the Albanian segment and its discontent, as long as Macedonia is essentially isolated, owing to the conflict with Greece, as long as the purchasing power of the population is, is very low, um, average salary in Macedonia is uh, the equivalent of 400 Canadian dollars a month. As long as, uh, and as long as Macedonia yet does not provide institutional capacity, as long as institutions are still largely dysfunctional, I don't think that foreign investors are going to flock in. The other source of foreign investment is the Macedonian diaspora, for instance. Albania received a huge influx of foreign investment over the last 10 years, uh, more than $6 billion in net terms. Most of this money came from Albanians who live in Switzerland and Czech Republic and so on and so forth. So this was money which came from the from diaspora. Here, the Macedonian diaspora is a big failure. They did not invest in Macedonia. They did not promote Macedonia, with very few exceptions. They did not help Macedonia the way the Jews helped the state of Israel. Why is that? First of all, within the Macedonian diaspora, there is no cohesion and no coherence. Some Macedonians are more, how to put it gently, pro-Bulgarian. Some Macedonians in the diaspora are too removed. Many of them are so self-interested that if there is the slightest risk in investing in Macedonia, they will not invest because they care about their money more than they care about their <coughs> Macedonian identity, whatever that is. So there is no organized diaspora as the Albanians have, as the Israelis have, and even to some extent the Serbs, the, definitely the Ukrainians, the Russians. All these nations, including nations in Asia, rely on the diaspora not only for money, but for networking, for management know-how for education, for Macedonia is divorced from its diaspora. Uh, people come and go visit, people send money, so there is a lot of, there are a lot of remittances. About 20% of the GDP of Macedonia is in the form of remittances. So people send money to their families, but this is money for consumption. Mm -hmm. They don't invest in anything. In Israel, Every street you have a school donated by this Jew, and a, a hospital donated by this Jew, and whole roads donated by families, and, and you know, you name it. Israel is built from scratch by the diaspora. I blame the Macedonian diaspora for the state the Macedonian economy is in. I do not blame foreign investors. Had I been a foreign investor, I would not go to Macedonia at this stage. I would wait for Macedonia to stabilize and to join the EU. But had I been a, Macedo um, a Macedonian living in Canada or the United States, I would have tried to do something for my homeland if I regard it as a homeland. So maybe Macedonians just talk and they don't really regard Macedonia as a homeland. That's the way it looks. You're also in Toronto to promote uh, your book, Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. My understanding is that you have this um, disorder. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know if this is like self-diagnosis or... Oh no, I've been diagnosed twice. Twice. I've been diagnosed twice. Why 
did you think that it's very important to put it in the book and to write about it, to express your thoughts about this mental disorder? Because I think it's a mental, a mental disorder of our times, not of individuals only, but of entire civi societies, of civilization, uh, Western civilization, as, is, as it is taking over the world. I think it is a, a disorder which, uh, I don't think, I mean, now it's been proven in studies, that it is a disorder that is becoming much more prevalent in the younger generations, the Facebook and Twitter generations. Mm -hmm. It's a disorder that characterizes political parties, serial killers, uh, true crime, young generations, internet technologies. Narcissism is a poison that has now spread to all venues and all aspects of our existence. Uh, Christopher Lash, a uh, famous American scholar, in 1974 wrote a book called The Cultural Narcissist. He was the first to suggest that our civilization and culture are narcissistic. But even he did not predict to what extent this will, this will uh, take over. Even technology today is tailored to cater to our narcissism. Even, even political parties today Political parties have become personality cults. Technology has be, has, is encouraging us to, to become our own demigods. We are told that there is nothing we cannot do if we only put our mind to it. The education, education has become narcissistic. Civilization, everything is. So I thought that studying uh, narcissism should become the main preoccupation of uh, psychology and even social psychology. And that's why I wrote my, my book. Um, only 1% of all population yeah. have this uh, a mental disorder, and uh, more than 50% is in males. Um, but also many people uh, who are um, at the highest rank of their careers, doesn't matter is it political or in media, they have been diagnosed having this disorder? I don't know if they've been diagnosed because very few narcissists go attend therapy or go to diagnosticians but mm -hmm. it is true that narcissists tend to gravitate mm -hmm. towards certain professions yes. where they can garner attention, adulation, admiration and so on. So it stands to reason and has been supported in studies that narcissists, that there is an over-representation of narcissists, they would be over-represented in professions such as politics, mm -hmm. law enforcement, judges, policemen, uh, show business, the media, and so on. So in these professions, it is, we are more likely to find narcissists than in the general population. But we are talking, here we are talking about the disorder, the extreme, radical, malignant, and sick form of narcissism. Destructive one. The self-destructive and destructive to others. The form that also involves antisocial and psychopathic behaviors. Mm -hmm. The form where people completely lack empathy. They're exploitative. They trample upon other people. They use them as objects. Mm -hmm. They objectify them. But what I'm saying is that narcissism is a spectrum. And we can find more and more narcissistic manifestations, narcissistic style of personality, narcissistic behaviors and narcissistic traits, even among people who would not normally be diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. So it's not full-fledged or full-scale, but you be begin to see people behave narcissistically even if they are not narcissists. Or they have a narcissistic personality style even if they are not fully narcissistic and full narcissist. So, it's becoming, it's a slow working poison that is beginning to affect everything, institutions, individuals, society, culture, civilization, everything is being affected to varying degrees. In the upper echelon, in the upper layer, we have the really very sick individuals, those who have narcissistic personality disorder. But I would say that huge parts of the population are now, one way or the other, exposed to narcissism or behave narcissistically. One of the uh, people that you uh, characterized as an artistic um, uh, is uh, the President Obama. You did your homework, yeah. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Why? In 2008, long before he became President, by the way, he was a uh, senator at the time. In 2008, I wrote a series of articles about political narcissism. 
And uh, I studied uh, historical figures. So I read the work of Fromm, for instance, who studied mm -hmm. Hitler, and mm -hmm. Stalin. And I tried to see which of the current crop of politicians at the time, 2008, would, uh, would fit the bill. So I began to watch videos of various politicians. Putin fit the bill perfectly. But by that time, everyone was saying that Putin is a Nazist and there was nothing new about it. And then I saw this young uh, black senator, uh, Barack Obama, and he, he caught my attention. At the beginning, his body language caught my attention. His, you know, visionary stare, his, his airs, his, uh, you know. I thought it was, I thought his regal conduct, body language-wise, was a bit incongruent with his very, very, very modest achievements in life and his lack of accomplishments, in effect. And yet he behaved as though he was, you know, the second Winston Churchill. And he was, at that time, nothing. He was not even nominated. And uh, I said, you know, he's a, he, he was serving his fourth year as a senator. I said, it doesn't justify this kind of... So let, let me delve deeper. And I watched a total of 1,000 hours of video of Barack Obama uh, available then. I then applied to him tests which are common in, diagno in remote diagnosing narcissists. One of the most famous tests is known as pronoun density. How many times you use the word I, me, myself, mine in a sentence? Now there is a general measure of pronoun density in the, in the population, general population. Uh, and he was using, his pronoun density was sometimes 60 times the average. 60 times. That was shocking. It's enough for you to exceed five times the pronoun density for to be considered a narcissist. He, in many speeches, he exceeded 20, 30, and there was one speech with 60 times. So that that was a red uh, bulb. You know. When is it that um, people with this disorder become dangerous for the, themselves and for the society? They are dangerous from, from the first moment, but they are excellent at uh, disguising their self-destructive and uh, streak, and they are great thespians, they're great actors. They're charming, most of them are very charming. They are excellent mimics, so they imitate empathy and emotions very convincingly. They have what I call cold empathy. Cold empathy is the ability to fully grasp their interlocutors, to realize, to, to sympathize with other people, but to use it to advantage. So they would size up people, they would read them properly, They're, they would read the body language, they would understand the emotions of these people and so on, but they would always be scanned for vulnerabilities. They would always, they would always be looking for chinks in the armor, for fault lines, and then they would use it, they would home in like cruise missiles and they would use it for, to achieve, to accomplish benefits. So, cold empathy is one of the characteristics of, uh, of narcissists. Now, again, reverting to Barack Obama, he was like that. He, he had this, you could see, I could see that he's imitating. He knew what sentences go with what emotions. He knew and he was reading his public very well and he was using it to good effect, I mean, beneficial effect. When the narcissist, inevitably, the, in life, there are failures and defeats. When these failures and defeats accumulate, when the narcissist is then exposed to criticism, disagreement, the narcissist begins to crumble. As he crumbles, uh, and as he becomes more and more self-defeating and self-destructive, he takes, he takes down with him everyone everyone around and everything around and so this is where the narcissist is dangerous not in what he might do to others but in what he might do to himself and then when he implodes the effect and of course if you are the president of the united states and you implode the results are catastrophic globally
I vo dnešnova emisija imame nekoliko informaciji. Radio emisijata Glas od Makedonija so Dragica Lapajkovska Belčeska. Možete da ja sledite se koja nedela od 6 do 7 na večer na 101.3 FM i da se razonavljite so sodržinite koji što ste podgotveni. Za vaši tepatuvanja pak bilo kada vo svetot, a osobeno vo Makedonija, obratite se kaj Dragica koja se ga raboti za Mosaic Tours, agencija so golema reputacija i mnogogodišno iskustvo. Dragica možete se kogaš da ja dobijete na telefon Telefon od 416-691-7184 ili na celularni od 647-780-6549. Za si te vaši proslavi od beležuvanja koristite gi banke Calitevo Crkvata Sveti Klement Ohridski vo Toronto. Za informacije i rezervacije javite se na 416-421-7451. Kanadskoto makedonsko mesto vo Toronto je pezinevski dom koji vi obezbeduva ugodno i harmonično življenje. Za poveke informacije pobarajte je Zlatka na 416-755-9231. Za profesionalno i povolno dizajniranje na web sajtovi pobarajte je TJ Hosting na 647-547-3061. I sekako čitajte makedonski vesti, sega i so detaljne informacije i važni nadpisi za makedonskata komuna vo Toronto. Za site vrsti na životno osigurovanje, osigurovanje za kreditični bolesti, osigurovanje na vaši od kredit za kukja, invalidsko i zdravstveno osigurovanje i osigurovanje koga potuvate, javite se na 416-503-2285. Nije, ki vi pomogneme da ga odberete najdobro to i najpovoljno to osigurovanje za vas. Za doverljivo, profesionalno i praktično popolnuvanje na vašite taksi, javite se na Flint Tax Income Tax servisi na 416-302-5433 i pobarajte go vecko. Za grižljiva nega na vašata kosa i neizino profesionalno stiliranje, pobarajte ja Elizabeta na 647-281-5501 vo Neo Hair Design što se naogja na 980 Pipa Venija vo Toronto. Toronto District School Board ovo zmožuva održuvanje na časovi po makedonski jazik preko internacionalnata jazična programa za deca na vozraz od 5 do 13 godini. Časovite se održuva dvo ponedelnik od 4.30 popladne do 7 časa od popladne vo učilišteto Diffenbaker koje se naogja vo East York. Za poveke informacije javite se do nastaničkata Blaga Dakovska na telefon od 416 Dva, osum, devet, četiri, sedum, pet, nula. Ete počutovani gledači, to je sve što podgotivme za ova 321. emisija na makedonsko izdanje, koja možete se koja ždaja sledite na www.macedonianedition.tv. Do naša ta naredna sredba na 2. novembri ova godina. Vi blagodaram za vaše to cenito vnimanje, prijatno i doviduvanje. Oh, da 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 da
Oh, oh, oh. 